We're going to get started in a few minutes. So I would ask you during this section here, we have six companies. Uh, one company uh, is a no-show, but we have six companies, Azurius uh, is not here, but we have six companies that are going to be giving pitch presentations. Uh, since each one of them, each one of them um, spent a lot of time and money to come here, uh, please show them the courtesy of uh, turning off your cell phones and ending conversations or having your conversations out here because this is a very serious thing for each one of them. So what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to do is something styled after a Silicon Valley pitch session. Uh, we've got three judges here. We've got six companies in the digital media and social media space from around the country. Those companies um, are going, each one of them is going to give a presentation that lasts exactly five minutes. Um, they'll be told when five minutes is up by a gong, and our lovely conference manager, Marsha, will gong. Marsha, gong. There you go. <laughs> it's an easy, easiest role she's played since she was here. And just so that we keep everything equal, each one of the judges will also be gonged after one minute. Okay. Otherwise, we won't get through this in a timely manner. So we're going to try to each. Um, do we? Can I see the hands of the people who are going to be presenting? I just want to make sure you're all around. Okay. So everyone's here. We're not missing anybody. Okay. So when uh, when the judges are making their judgment, um, the next person can go up and get themselves ready. And um, the, now, the fun part about all this is the judges actually don't get a vote. They only get a recommendation, a la American Idol. To vote, the voting belongs to you, okay? So the vote, so you'll see that that's a sample up there. That happens to be for the first company. Uh, it's a little, a tiny bit of a misnomer there because it's not just should this company be funded. These companies are pitching either for funding for partnerships or both, okay? And so the question is whether whatever the company is pitching for, hopefully they'll state that pretty explicitly, are they worthy of being funded? Are they worthy of partnering with or both, okay? And um, so you have three possibilities. Yes, which is two points. Maybe, which is one point. No, which is no points. You'll see there it's text. It's hard to see there. What is it? 1A, is that right? D1A266937, okay? So after each presentation, you'll have a minute or two to send in your votes. Those are gonna be tabulated by our company, Moses, uh, which is doing this work, which is, by the way, tomorrow, um, I encourage you to text all your messages um, up to the screen because they really uh, put in a lot of hard work for us and we really haven't been using their, their service too thus far. But um, so after each presentation, text in your, uh, your vote. And then tonight, uh, during the reception, we will tabulate all the votes. We'll add them together. Um, and we'll come up with a winner. If there's a tie, I get to break it. Um, <laughs> but hopefully, there won't be a tie. Um, and I think that's it. All right. So any questions? OK. So why don't I first let the, uh, let the introduce themselves. We tried to have a, a cross-section of judges from entertainment, uh, from the corporate world, and from, invest, and from uh, venture capital so that we represent all those worlds that we re represent elsewhere in the conference. So, uh, Klaus, why don't we start with you and we'll work our way left. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. My name is Klaus Heise. Um, I used to run the U.S. subsidiary for Deutsche Telekom's Venture Arm, so I 
an investor for about nine years, uh, the last four and a half of that here in the US. And um, I have branched out from Deutsche Telekom recently, end of last year, and working on starting my own venture fund, so basically going from strategic investment to purely financially driven investment. Hi, I'm uh, Harshal Sanghi from Aurora Ventures. Um, I'm based up in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, lead our West Coast presence. Um, Motorola Ventures is the strategic uh, venture arm of uh, Motorola, and uh, we invest about $100 million annually. Uh, we currently have uh, $500 million under management. Uh, that represents about, at this point, it's about 50 companies actively being managed, total of uh, about 85 companies. And uh, obviously, we, you know, we invest in companies uh, that can drive our uh, strategic vision of seamless mobility of uh, content uh, through various devices. Okay. Hi, my name is Donald Wong, and um, as I said this morning, uh, my job at Sony Pictures Entertainment is to help our studio bridge the, the gap between the physical analog world and their workflows uh, to the digital virtual. Um, it's kind of interesting. I'm up here with the money guys, and really the only thing I bring to the table is not a fat wallet, but more every week, you know, we get pitched quite a bit from various vendors technologies and, and, and solutions, and um, I, I wish I had a way to text to say yes, no, maybe. So th this, this should be interesting. <laughs> yeah. But don't actually, don't, don't be so shy, because he's a very important role. He tends to buy the companies where we invest in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, companies who are presenting, one last point, I, I think either I or Marsha went through this with each of you. If you do nothing else in your presentation, you've got to mention whether funding, whether you want a partnership or both. Otherwise, you're not going to get a vote. Okay? Um, All righty. So we'll get started. Uh, whenever you get started, Marsha, we'll start timing and I'll sit down. Oh, uh, one more thing. I forgot one thing. Best of show award. I have my lovely assistant will now show you the best of show award. Behold, the coveted Digital Media Summit of show award. That's it. This Applause. is it. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thank you. That was a lit. That was a little bit. Come on. A little bit. Let's try that again. Behold the coveted Digital Media Summit Award. Behold. We're also putting out a, a press release announcing the winner. Okay, that's it. Hello, my name is Brian Dunn. I'm an executive vice president with Investigo SA, and I'd like to thank iHollywood for putting together this program and for the panelists for giving of their time. We feel kind of lucky we're presenting today. We're in the content filtering business, so the Viacom YouTube lawsuit is very relevant. Those 100,000 video clips were run through our system a couple weeks ago after they had gone through a very laborious process of manually looking at all those clips. They ran to see what kind of automation we could lend to the process, uh, and it was substantial. I've been in a couple conferences today or, or breakout sessions where people have asked the question, uh, does content filtering work? Can this be done? Let me show you how it works. So this is um, what I'm going to do is compare what we call suspect videos, something that we may have downloaded uh, from a UGC site or off of a peer-to-peer -peer network and compare it to an original. That's in a master fingerprint database. So you see the suspect content on the left. We're going through a nine-step process, which is really part of um, kind of identifying the characteristics of the content. That can be uh, changes in dynamic range of the music or the saturation of the color. And then we go through a process of normalization and indexation, which prepares that content for the final step, which is um, the actual comparison process itself. In this case, it's identified this content as being copyrighted video. What I'll do now is run both videos kind of a, a visual manual check that an attorney or somebody responsible for compliance would look at to make sure that, that, that our system did accurately find uh, content that's in violation. So you can see uh, the original content again is on the right, so somebody can do a very quick visual check. So what we have is a 10-minute excerpt from a two-hour movie, and from the 10-minute excerpt, we took out a, a minute uh, uh, of content, and from that, we.
printed it and compared it to the fingerprint that was originally generated by you know the ten minute snippet from the to our movie um, and we've made a comparison now, now this is a process this can be done in a matter of seconds this may take eight seconds it may take eighteen seconds the point to be made is if somebody's uploading video to YouTube or MySpace or something like that, it's going to take 20, 30 seconds, a minute or so. So we, this process could be going on in the background and, and not uh, in any way, shape, or form interfere with the user experience for someone who's uploading legitimate content. One more, one more clip. Here's one of the important aspects of this technology is that it's robust. It can deal with all the different types of um, changes in the content that can be made by virtue of poor re-encoding or uh, in this case, here's a mirrored piece of content where this, where this by virtue of camcording is literally backwards. And our technology can go through its nine-step process and be able to identify it as copyrighted content. Here's the suspect video on the left. Here's the original video on the right, and you can see where the content on the left has been reversed, but we've been able to normalize and index it and be able to identify it. So this is a very robust technology, and I think that what I really want to emphasize to you is this, this is available in the marketplace. Um, our technology has been evaluated by the MPAA, it's been evaluated by Movie Labs, MySpace has been working with it here for a couple of months. This is something that can be done now. We're the only technology that can actually be deployed we productized our, our, our service into a one U box. We can also, and, and that's something we can tur turn key to a, um, a video site. We also uh, support it under an ASP model for people that don't have the infrastructure to, to host their own servers. We're a private company. We're based in Paris, founded in 2002, launched our products in 2004. We're venture backed by French VCs to the tune of about 6 million euro. Uh, we have four international patents. Our customers include um, Warner Brothers, EMI, Universal Music, and a lot of the European royalty reporting societies. Uh, we have a partnership with Thompson, where our technology is sold alongside their entertainment security applications. I, I won't be taking home the trophy tonight. But <laughs> we do need money, and uh, can I continue, or do I have to get off the stage after five minutes? All right. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty enthusiastic in the main. Actually, um, content recognition technology has come so far uh, now. Um, I've seen a number of examples, uh, partly on the audio, partly on the, on the image side. Um, I think the real problem in this area is, uh, I'm not sure if it was a gentleman from NBC who mentioned it earlier today, um, there's not a standardized approach yet. There are between 10 and 20 companies doing this. And the problem is about the fingerprinting. So the owner needs to create the fingerprints before or needs to submit the original clips to kind of a YouTube so that they can generate the fingerprints. It's still a lot of uh, process involved. So I'm confident that in the end um, there will be a solution for this out in the market, dominating the market. But right now for me it's very hard to predict um, which one of the companies doing this uh, will actually uh, succeed in becoming the marketer, even if uh, they all work similarly well. But if there were marks for presentation, I don't think I'd be able to give the gentleman there too many marks. I really didn't understand right in the beginning what he was showing, apart from the fact that he you know, did some uh, content recognition there. Um, fingerprinting of content is something that's been around for a long time, so I don't see what's unique about it. Um, I think uh, as far as monetizing it, again, uh, having a hardware, um, be, uh, you know, just trying to sell a piece of hardware, um, I think is, is a tough model. I wasn't sure uh, about a couple of things, but um, what it comes down to from a studio perspective, I'd like to know who owns the fingerprint database. Do, do we own it? Does the service provider own it? Uh, what's the revenue model? Are they going to be charging the YouTubes of the world? versus the studios and the content owners. Um, what's the minimum length of a video that, that is required for detection? Um, 
The uh, gentlemen up here have said there are a lot of different players up here. Um, I've, I've seen a number of these different uh, types of presentations. Um, I'd like to know more, but there wasn't anything that distinguished it. Maybe. No. No. on that. Good afternoon. My name is Barry Lowther. I'm with SciTech Corporation, and I'm here to introduce Digital Video Vision. It's the next platform for delivering, it's the new, it's the platform delivering the next generation of television, pardon. DV2 is uh, comprised of an integrated solution set. It's, um, it's a hardware platform that allows you to, to access internet-based video to the television. DV2 bridges uh, your internet connection to your television to play internet video, the video you can't see on broadcast television. Also, Swirl TV is the user interface that resides on DV2. Through Swirl TV, the users are able to manage content, play content, and actually upload content either to, to publish to the worldwide community or to only to your favorite channel. There are two key drivers that, uh, that drove us to develop a DV2 product. First and foremost was uh, today's consumers want video on demand and they want it on their schedule. Also, broadcast television is at a decline while social video is on the increase. We saw DV2 as, a, as an opportunity to marry uh, this, this problem, this void in the market, to be able to enjoy social videos in the comforts of your home, on your home television. Also, the new media, new media is changing the way uh, we view content today. Uh, Internet-based video distribution offers a, a cheap, easy, and flexible solution. Also, it's creating a disruptive technology in the broadcast industry. The competitive landscape is um, uh, everybody's familiar with getting Internet video content. Uh, you get it through your web browser on your PC. Also, there are other solutions uh, to get internet content uh, to the television through Akimbo or TiVo, a couple of the others, or the high-end media center. DV2 and Swirl TV is different. DV2 is an appliance. It's a PC. It does one thing. It plays internet-based video to your television, the content that you can't get on broadcast television, cable, or satellite. Also, it's priced right. To access the content via Swirl TV, it's free. We don't charge a monthly subscription fee. And the DV2 hardware platform is actually priced in line with consumer electronics products. Using Swirl TV, we incorporate a lean back technology based on your viewing habit and your, and your areas of interest. You can define content that you're interested in, and DV2 brings that to you for you to decide whether you want to watch it. Our business model is based on four revenue streams. First is advertising revenue, hardware sales, licensing and access fees for pay-per-view content, and custom solution sales, specifically targeted to the advertising, education, and sports mark vertical markets. The availability of DV2 is uh, we're completing our final stages of testing. Uh, we have 
registration units that are currently available for trial, and we're slated for a web rollout, web sales rollout in mid-2007. We are a pre-revenue company. Uh, we're internally funded thus far uh, through R&D. Uh, we're seeking an investment partner uh, for external capital funding, for working capital, and uh, for business development and marketing strategy to roll out the DV2 product. Also, we're seeking content partners, specifically content owners and distributors who are seeking an expanded and, and new delivery content delivery method for delivering content to the home television using the internet. In summary, Swirl TV and DV2 is poised to deliver the next generation of television. And DV2 provides easy to use, low cost internet video delivery platform. And most importantly, we're capital to continue to grow. And we also have a demo set up. I encourage you to come by. We'd be glad to show it to you. Thank you very much. So I actually, I have cheated a bit because I have uh, looked at their demo this afternoon and uh, I really like the solution. Absolutely. So far, most of what I have seen uh, needs to use a PC in the middle that basically does the connection to the internet and this is crap that does not work in a normal household. So this is uh, one of the first solutions uh, connecting directly to internet video and I like it very much for that and their targeted price point is also very attractive um, that probably should be easy to sell. There's one big area where I'm concerned about and that's uh, defendability or basically uh, it will not be long before other people come up with similar solutions as well. Um, so DB2 might be a better um, user interface, but unless they have patents or any really good defendability about there, can generate quickly enough um, a big following in the market, uh, my inclination would be love it, want to use it, but maybe not investing in it. All right. Um, selling hardware at retail, very difficult. Uh, unless it's a $50 box. Um, people are trying to reduce the clutter around their television, not increase it. Um, so I don't see people buying that. And at $50, I don't see how much money they can make. I don't see why I'm going to, how they'll make money on advertising for user-generated content or internet content. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a commodity. There's no IP over there. Um, definitely not an investment uh, play. There are about, you know, I can name half a dozen companies up in Silicon Valley that are uh, you know, littered with tombstones trying to do the same model. Uh, some of those there. I was there at the early stages of actually trying to sell uh, TiVo, and even today, TiVo has only sold about a million standalone boxes, period. Is that a yes or no? No. I said that <laughs> in the beginning. Sorry. Um, the speaker spent a little bit of time talking about stuff that I think most of us already knew, especially for this audience to hear, have heard more on what distinguishes their business model, the product itself. Is there any sort of unique uh, proprietary technology um, that can sort of withstand the onslaught of, you know, if it's a $50 box or $100 box, the competitor would be a $30 box from China in a matter of months. Um, you made a comment about this is yet another device that you have to plug in. I think all of us have way too many remotes, way too many boxes that we, we are running out of on our, uh, on our TV sets? Um, short answer would be no. All Did everyone hear that? Uh, it says slide number three because one of the companies, Azurius, is not here. That's why. Do you need another company? 
<laughs> it's a little bit. That's an bit. enterprising entrepreneur. It's a little late in the game. Let's see how our time. Let's see how our time goes. Okay. Bring him on. The wild card. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Dinesh, Chief Revenue Officer of Fixate. Um, we've got five minutes, so I'm gonna to try to be quick. Um, is that forward? I think it is. Great. All right, we have a company called Fixate. Um, I'm gonna to try to explain what the software does in 1,200 moving pictures, and then we'll move on to the presentation proper. If you click the center of that, a video should play. If you can just click that, or just left click that. Left click it. Oh. I think you've missed the video, so. Um, well, I can't show you the demo of the software. It, I think it's clicked over there, yeah. Can I restart and use my computer? I think I should do that. Yeah. Um, I want to quickly show what the software does. And um, like I said, in 12 moving pictures, we're going to do that. Fixate is a software that puts a personal animation studio in the palm of your hand. It is what one other person described as user-generated animation. We call it user-generated reality. And what it does is it allows a full spectrum of expression on top of just the raw reality video feed. So it's not just animation, it's 2D, 3D accessories, dress up, photorealistic avatar creation as well. There's a soundtrack to it, but we'll go along with it. So we hope that uh, people will basically be fixated by the video. It allows the creation of rich user-generated content very easily and in real time. So hopefully it's gonna be ready for the kind of stuff that we require. We're headquartered here in Los Angeles, California. We have a business and software development office in China. We're looking to take advantage of users in both China and the US. We've raised three million in a series one. We're looking for another two million, three million to complete our series one B. We have intellectual property that's called HART, Human Expression Analysis and Rendering Technology, which actually captures the expressions in real time from your face, uh, on a webcam and then renders that to a digital puppet or avatar and gives them expressions or breathes life into them. Uh, just want to quickly go over the officers are mostly from a technology internet background. Um, the advice board, very technical. We've now decided to make this a B2C tool and uh, hopefully in the hands of users, consumers, it can be very, very powerful. Um, the software is applicable across multiple platforms, PC, TV, and mobile. Yes, we have a TV play as well, uh, what we call user-generated reality telev television. Uh, allows you to, um, as you know, uh, uh, take on a new identity, presence, freedom to express and share, interaction, and content as well, content monetized, uh, as we've seen before. We see this term, we coin user-generated reality, being the glue that bonds today's media matrix over uh, a whole bunch of different plays, as you can see there. Video blogging, instant messaging, social network and community sites, and a non-linear uh, television, interactive online applications, uh, non-linear and interactive internet and TV play. I think it's gonna have a lot to do with stitching TV and internet formats together. Um, these are ap uh, examples of the application. The application can be streamed live over an instant messenger as well, uh, over the television, and can be posted to a video blog, for example. Uh, revenue opportunities, all of these are revenue opportunities. You can have personality avatars, bundle webcam offers, product linking, advertising banners. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, revenue opportunities that doesn't depreciate or devalue the time commodity. It's built into the screen as you're looking at it. 
Um, product line, our software is absolutely free. We monetize off the content or sponsorship that we create. Uh, just what's in our labs, we have reloaded where it'll bring animation to hand movements as well. We have a mobile play and we're looking at virtual worlds. Um, what we're targeting is the early majority market. In the US, that's about 75 million users. About one third of them are webcam enabled. That's about a 26 million <coughs> market segment. Similar statistics in China, 65 million early majority group users. Probably about one third of them webcam enabled. So that's a pretty large market segment. We're looking to get about 5 million users in the first year. Uh, partnership opportunities, we're looking at branded content partners across the internet space, social networking, community sites, <clears throat> video sharing sites, internet TV, instant messaging applications, and for TV production partners, TV networks interested in merging internet 2.0 with TV for new and exciting format plays, bringing user-generated content to the TV and investment opportunity. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, there have been companies in this space before. I knew a couple of them in 2002. They were focused on the mobile, and uh, I think the, the timing was not right at that time. What Fixate is doing um, seems much more expanded, and I think now uh, the timing is right to really capture not only a few geeks, but uh, a large part of the creative users with all the user-generated video and the mashups. Um, being much more uh, in favor right now. So I really like it. Thank you, Invest. All right. Um, very, uh, very cool. Definitely a very cool demo. Um, I see this as a for a YouTube or any other social uh, community sites. Um, it would be nice to see them have a partnership with uh, an online uh, community. Um, I would like to understand more about what the mobile, uh, you know, the requirements to, to use it on the mobile are, what sort of display graphics processing requirements are there. Um, that might be a little bit of a challenge. Um, is it an investment for us? Probably not. Is it an acquisition for a YouTube or a Yahoo? Definitely, yes. Um, a video is worth 10,000 words. Loved it. How do I get a copy? Hello, everybody. My name is Colleen Neistat, and I'm the founder and CEO of MovieSet. And MovieSet brings fans and filmmakers together in a brand new way. I come from the production side of the business, having spent most of my adult life in the trenches. My first company uh, pro provided production services on dozens of pictures throughout the 90s in Vancouver, until I sold it to a public company in 2000. Several years later, I went out on my own again and shif shifted my focus to the distribution side of the business, which led me to Show West. Back in 2003, 2004, everybody was complaining about shrinking audiences, increased cost of media buys, just as the fans were clearly migrating to the web. And if I can get this to work, ah, bingo. Uh, things would never be the same. So today, one, more than one billion people worldwide use the internet. And more and more people spend more and more time online participating in a whole host of new activities, resulting in an increasingly fragmented audience. This is a huge challenge for the film industry. Okay. In the face of these facts, even though one third of the movie going public some 55 million people in North America alone get their movie information online. Less than 4% of the ad dollars were spent on the internet. This compares to a 9% average across other industries in the United States. Notwithstanding, online advertising in the filmed entertainment sector is expected to increase to as much as 10% in the next few years. 
That means by the MPAA statistics going from little over 200 million in 2006 to well over 500 million by 2010 in the studios alone. Compounding this, there we go, add to these facts the overall increase in brand advertising, particularly with social networking sites, and you see a shortage of quality online ad space. Therein lies a tremendous opportunity to capitalize on these trends, and that's where MovieSet comes in. Now, upon a time, the DVD was the fastest growing tech device in history. And besides the featured presentation, they also contained behind the scenes extras, which the people loved. Then gradually, technological advances enabled downloading and streaming of movies, which made the people happy. But what then about the behind the scenes extras? And the answer, of course, is movie set which brings the movie set to the internet. Movie set really represents a three-way value prop. It's a win-win-win situation. Advertisers want to go where the uh, eyeballs are, and eyeballs equal fans. But they want to target key consumer groups with definable ROI. Fans want to engage with compelling content, and they're not satisfied with passive consumption anymore. They have an insatiable appetite for behind the scenes, and they want the real thing. Finally, producers want to attract the largest possible audience, but to do so, they must give the fans what they want when they want it, and that's where movie set comes in. We're kind of in stealth mode, so I can't show you a lot of this, but movie set advances the marketing of motion pictures to the beginning, from green light through delivery. It accomplishes this by superimposing a, social, a fan social networking environment over a uh, production content management and workflow system. And it has to, because the prime directive when you're making a movie is getting it in the can on time and on budget, not messing with a website. When you're working 18 hours a day, you don't want to add to the workload, and that's the beauty of MovieSet. MovieSet provides producers with a ready-made toolkit that integrates with production and also includes engagement in e-commerce opportunities. It enables live streaming video, daily video blogs, galleries for organizing stills, community tools like blogs, forums, and chat, fan registration and data analytics, contest polls and testing, prop auction, product placement, swag sales, and a dizzying array of digital and mobile downloads. MovieSet believes that every movie has a core audience, and it's our job to find them and engage them. To quote Fox Searchlight's Peter Rice in a recent New Yorker article, you don't need 80% 80, 80 of the entire public to know about your movie. You need 100% of those who the movie is for. We have, oh no. Well, shoot. I should have talked faster. So this one is tough for me, maybe because I'm uh, from Silicon Valley and not from uh, down here. Um, I don't know how many people actually watch the extras DVDs. Um, I, I can really, it, it's hard for me to see what makes a uh, movie set special. Um, it seems for me that it targets producers of movies as a toolkit for producers to, um, I don't know, direct advertising to the audience. Um, the only way I could see this succeed or gain more market share than this is a very special relationship with the studios, so with the content owners. I would probably not invest. It wasn't clear from the presentation um, what Moviset was trying to achieve. Um, I think the presenter did say a few times, and that's where movie set comes in, but I wasn't sure quite where it comes in. Um, I think it's trying to do too many things when you look at that list of things on the left on that last slide. I think they're trying to achieve too many things, the tool, the blog site, um, just, just a bunch of too many, th uh, you know, just, just way too many things. Uh, and I really don't see how you can monetize it. Is it an investment for us? Um, definitely not. I'd have to echo the other two gentlemen. Um, in my job, I, I deal a lot with productions, uh, especially on the post-production end. And, and invariably, something like this would fall to someone pretty junior uh, in, in the totem pole, a, a PA. Um, then you sort of run the risk of 
what if stuff doesn't get updated and what if something gets leaked out, footage that, that wasn't supposed to be leaked get, gets leaked out because someone put it on the wrong server. That stuff happens in the real world all the time and on the net it sort of gets magnified a hundredfold. I'd, I'd probably have to say no. So you're normally pretty nice people, just want to clarify that. Marks, get set, go. Okay, I'm uh, Tim Bieber, all the way from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. I'm the CEO and co-founder of RIP TV, which is, we are a niche broadband video community focused on digital content creation, aggregation, and publishing, which I'll get into in the presentation for a male under 30 extreme sports vertical. To fire it off, let me dazzle you. You'll like this, Donald. Let me make a video. This, this illustrates the mix of our in-house produced content and producer aggregated content. It will, I promise you. Dazzle, dazzle. So that's a, that's a mix of content that we produce in studio from our studios in Vancouver and on location, on the scene, and partner producers from around the world. Now, who we are, we, we beta launched this on January 07, so this is our first phase beta launch, and time permitting at the end, I'll get to a really quick demo. In the last two months, we've served over a million video streams. We're uh, about cash flow neutral right now in the last two months, generated a quarter of a million dollars through three key revenue models, advertising, merchandising, and syndication, which I can get to in a lot more detail later if you want to talk to me. For proof of concept, we raised, we raised a half a million dollars to bring to the January launch, and we're here right now for reasons, money, $1.5 million for phase two business expansion and also advertising relationships and contacts. So a, a, a really brief background of why us and why we can do this better than anybody else. We know content, we've produced content, extreme sports shows syndicated around the world with a series called Drop In, which many of you have probably seen, our fourth season of which we produced in, in New Zealand and have a number of advertisers that we leverage. Plus we have an existing extreme sports community 
which is in the top five largest extreme sport websites on the net with about 150 million hits a month. So we have experience. We come, we come at this taking it from a niche standpoint. However, when you see here, 76 million Y-Gens in a 12 to 24 year old demographic range, 50 million of which participate in extreme sports. So we're not talking about niche numbers. We're talking about a niche vertical of extreme sports. However, a gigantic number of Now, this right here is a uh, embeddable player. Part of the strategy and the growth model is not just aggregating eyeballs to the RIP TV platform. It's also, it's also through an embeddable player with playlisting which this is an active playlist where, where um, publishers can embed our player and tune in the content that they want for their community, which gives us an extended reach down the long tail, the, uh, which, which obviously for the advertisers, we become, we become a advertising network where we can access those small long tail sites in the extreme sports space. So let me show you a really quick demo here, which is going to be quite difficult since I can only look at my monitor. I can do it with both. You're going to have to give me 30 extra seconds just because I came all the way from Canada. <laughs> Good pitch. <clears throat> okay, so I pre-buffered this. Go back to the Fort Bay. Okay, I'm going to take this down. I'm going to... So what this is, this is a show we call Home Invasion. We go into action sports stars' houses, see how they live. In this case, this is, this is the biggest action, or the biggest mountain bike star. So here, all these MetaTag links appear. Um, we can use these to find out more information. We can find out more about Darren Bearcloth, obviously advertising cues, uh, blow it up to full screen. The, the uh, codec that we're using is, is a, a nice high resolution, so once we get to more of the 10-foot view and a 42-inch plasma, it's an enjoyable viewing experience. Um, the, the actual, skip ahead here, um, so for a, product, for a product link, this is actually a deal that we've got in base with Adidas Eyewear. Instead of directing the traffic to the Adidas website, we'll, yeah. we'll direct that traffic directly to our e-commerce platform right and actually sell Adidas Eyewear that will be drop shipped from the drop shipped from the distributor. So there's a number of different, not just advertising in and around and interstitials, and we have, we actually have a proprietary ad serving technology for in-stream advertising, but we're also looking at every other advertising, merchandising and syndicating revenue model to substantiate the growth of. Um, and also an, an on-demand, a whole on-demand section. And what's neat is you can also you can also continue watching as you're scanning through all of the content and picking up the different mix of content between what we produce and what we're aggregating from those producer partners. So that's it. Thanks for the extra time. That is really cool. So, very impressive. Um, in terms of the in investment or financing side, um, since Tim mentioned that he, or that, that Drip TV actually is also engaged in the producing side, I would really have to look into the um, cost structure of the, of the business and how it scales when they actually uh, grow. Um, so that's one of the things which I can't and the other is uh, I don't know enough of the market to speak to the potential exit value um, for how much this business can be sold once you have a, a certain number of users. So I have to stay with a maybe. Excellent presentation. Um, I think, you know, this company is very fundable. Um, you know, they've shown, and you know, bottom line, content is king, and these guys show it. Um, you know, they're very clear about their demographic. They're very clear about their uh, monetization uh, uh, perspective and how they're going to do it. They've actually shown um, and they're generating revenue. Um, I, I'd love to talk about, you know, a mobile play here because I think a lot of that content would be uh, great on mobile short clips um, and very, very fundable, very good. Huge believer in the value of owning your own content. If you can produce it at a reasonable cost, um, all the better. I would say definitely very strong, maybe. <laughs>
Well, good afternoon. My name is York Bauer. I'm Executive Vice President of Business Development at Zango. And yes, we start with a Z, and therefore I'm last in the lineup, and that makes me the only thing standing between you and a beer. And I recognize that, so fasten your seatbelts. Here we go. We're a little bit different than many of the companies you may have heard from. We're eight years old, based in Bellevue, Washington, 225 employees uh, spread across various operations around the world. Uh, we are profitable and have been for 21 quarters, so we're a little bit different animal. The way we've done that is we've created a, a, what is today a mature ecosystem, which I'll explain, that brings together some pretty impressive numbers, including 20 million uh, monthly uh, users. And we are here for one reason, one reason only, and that is to seek partnerships with uh, content providers and publishers. So what do we do? We bring together four constituencies, the content provider, the publisher, the advertiser, and the user. And the key in what we do, and I'll show you this in a second, is we uh, rely on desktop advertising software as opposed to content interrupting advertising to deliver our monetization. So let me show you how this works. Take your favorite jackass clip, and this is one of the user generated pieces of content in our uh, library of more than 100,000 pieces of content. It's your average video you might see on YouTube that someone has created. What happens is the content could be an individual or an organization, we work with both, uploads it into our content syndication platform. Then from that syndication platform, the publishers we work with, and we have several thousand that are in our network, takes selectively content they feel is appropriate for their user base and places it on their site. That content is now wrapped with our monetization vehicle. Along comes the user to that website, and they're asked with appropriate notice and consent to install our software in return for access to this library of and other content, including games and so forth, which I'll talk about. So what happens then is they see their video, and later, separated in time, not while they're watching the video, not while they're playing the game or whatever they came for, they then get served advertising through our toolbar product when they're surfing and shopping and interacting in an e-commerce mode on the web. So we, we separate the advertising delivery from the content consumption. We're one of the very few companies that does this. As a result, 100% of advertising that gets delivered to that user is effective because it's targeted and they're in the mindset to consume it. And that's really what makes us different. We this year will pay millions of dollars to content providers and over $10 million to our publishing partners. Uh, and again, what, what really makes it different is the separation of the advertising from the content consumption. Um, in the example that I showed you, this particular piece of content has to date netted the content provider some $72,000. This one clip and approximately a million and a half that we've paid out to our various publishing partners as a result, and it's generated 1.6 million uh, installations of our software uh, as a result of our, our model. Uh, a lot of focus on video here. Our model is completely content agnostic. Video is very popular for us. We're a top 15, or excuse me, a top 20 video site, but we're also a top 15 game site. And you can see we can monetize anything ranging from utilities and music and screensavers and emoticons, you name it, using this model. So. See, how was that for quick? All, all we'd like to do is talk to you if you have an interest in working with us as either a content provider to us or a publishing partner. I'm joined by Corey Wynn, who heads up Content Force. We'd we'll be happy to talk to you after the presentation. Thank you very much. So I think this is a hypothetical question about fundability because they're not really looking for money. But I think since uh, advertising and VCs are jumping left and right uh, to, to get into um, that area. And you can't really argue with a, a profitable business. I would say, yes, it's fundable. And I can also see why it's uh, very interesting to both kind of amateur content creators and also publishers. And uh, if they put a right incentive system in place, um, it could even encourage um, content creators to really have more high quality content that they submit. Um, targeted advertising, who can argue, who can argue with that? Um, you know, very cool model. Um, would, you know, question that I'd have is, uh, can the user uninstall their software or delete it? I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's like a tracking cookie, which a lot of ad, ad providers, uh, you know, uh, install on, on the PCs and then refresh it once they delete it. So, uh, but, but definitely they're monetizing it. And, uh, you know, I would think any online advertising portal uh, would be very interested in with them probably should look at an automated feeding mechanism for you know, content pr uh, providers and our partnerships 
with the publishers that might be an effective uh, tool. Like the fact that the user is only getting um, the ads when they're searching via a toolbar. Um, the only risk, I guess, the question would be how effective is that toolbar going to be because it does going to, it is going to take up a certain degree of real estate when all of us probably already have Yahoo or toolbar on our desktop if we're using something like that. But pretty interesting model and you can't argue against profitability. So very much maybe. <laughs> Um, I just want to thank uh, everybody. A lot of you came from different countries, from different countries, but from around the United States, it must be grueling and difficult. So I really do appreciate your coming, and you know, however this works out, um, we uh, will not have a microphone this evening at the reception. It may be a little bit uh, chaotic, so we're going to actually make the presentation uh, tomorrow morning. But okay. if we can do it at the reception, we will, because it's in a small area. So we if might there's a way we to. can do it, I guess we will. All right, so more. you must experience California Hollywood poolside reception. Um, some people told me this is their first time in Hollywood, and we actually had a celebrity today. Forrest Whitaker was upstairs, and we tried to get him down here, but we couldn't find him <laughs> to get him here, just so you could see a celebrity. In any case, you're going to go out the back door that says exit. I and my staff will be giving you a drink ticket for free drinks. Go to the very end of the swimming pool. You'll see a stanchion area with a great dinner, fires, bars. Please have a network. Thank you to AOL. You're our party sponsor. And have a great time. And see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. <laughs>